Hello, BookTube. Earlier today, I saw a video from Greg at Another Bibliophile Reads. It was a great video. I'll leave a link to it. It was just fantastic. Incredibly food for thought, and as he says in the video, probably a bone of contention for some of you. It revolved around the subject of adapting books into movies, whether it be movies for cable or dramatized over a whole season or movies for the big screen. And I love that subject. Absolutely love it. So I, I found it irresistible to make a response video. I'm pretty sure that he's probably anticipating that I'm going to make a response video. His uh, specific focus in his video was on five novels that he does not want to see adapted in any way. <laughs> he mentioned Geek Love. He mentioned Jerusalem by Alan Moore. He mentioned Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Uh, he mentioned Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole, and he mentioned the novel Valis by Philip K. Dick. Described each one of those, fascinating that he came up with those choices and, decide, and, and contends that he doesn't want to see those adapted no matter what. And, of course, in, in the background of his video, he is to a certain extent adopting a kind of artifice of a crusty old curmudgeon, which is, is obvious when he says that he's not a big fan of any book being adapted at all. <laughs> the only way that you could legitimately hold that opinion was if you believed either that it's never been done well, or that even the times when it's done well should not have been done. And since neither of those stances is tenable, you have to take crusty old curmudgeon with a bit of a grain of salt on his channel or on mine. <laughs> Now, I don't think the same way. I have long contended uh, that most books are improved by being adapted. <laughs> and you'd think that, that Greg would have covered his bets a little by the spread of the books that he picks for his choices, because two of the books that he picks stink, and so can't help but be improved by being adapted to, to any kind of screen. They can't help but be improved. But even there, even with the two books of his that stink, uh, there are examples where, where that sort of prove the rule. There, there are examples where, for instance, uh, when it comes to Cormac McCarthy, for instance, the, the movie adaptation of The Road was just as awful as the book. But the movie adaptation of All the Pretty Horses by Billy Bob Thornton uh, was really quite good. Uh, and had, uh, you know, uh, it's just as a side note, had the ongoing mystery of the career, or rather lack thereof, of Lucas Black. I do not understand this young man's career. I can only assume that this is yet another example of what I always talk about, where a lot of emphasis is on who is picking your projects. Actors themselves have the brain capacity of a guinea pig. So they're not picking their own projects. They hire someone who's either good at that or bad at that. Or, God forbid, I have no idea. I don't know anything about Lucas Black. But God forbid they let a, a family member do that. <laughs> but uh, they certainly don't do it themselves. And I don't understand. He steals the movie of All the Pretty Horses and has a bucket loads of talent. He has a huge amount of on-screen charisma. I have no idea what became of that. I have no idea why we, we've spent the last 10 years talking about, for instance, Tom Hardy when we should have been talking about this kid. Is it just the Fast and the Furious, did, did, did that, did Tokyo Drift kill his career? Is that what it is? Is it as simple as that? The Curse of Vin Diesel? <laughs> Where maybe just because that movie flopped because it wasn't all about family. <laughs> Could that be the reason? I don't know, one way or another. But the, the Billy Bob Thornton adaptation of All the Pretty Horses as a book stinks. But the movie is actually quite good. And the same thing is true with Philip K. Dick. If you were to read do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? If you had never written a word of narrative prose in your life and had never encountered the book before, so first time reading, no writing experience, in that first reading, you would be coming across things and saying, okay, well, that's an obvious flaw, and with no writing experience whatsoever, I know how to fix it. The fix is fairly easy. It's fairly obvious. The book is awful. And yet, Ridley Scott made an absolute cinematic classic in Blade Runner. So it is possible. It is possible to do even with flawed material. I, now I, of course, don't agree with Greg in his crusty old curmudgeon persona saying that it's, that it, it's, if he's saying that it's not possible to adapt something like Geek Love, I, without massive CGI 
I don't know how he could say that with, unless he's never seen a Fellini film. <laughs> but it, it would certainly be possible to do Geek Love without CGI. It wouldn't be possible, I don't think, to do Jerusalem without CGI, but would you want to? CGI is not the automatic kiss of death. He, in his video, he hilariously says that if a movie has a huge CGI budget, you know it's probably going to be a bad movie. And I wonder what a lot of you think of that. I wonder if a lot of you don't agree with that. Uh, I think that's, that's just absolutely fascinating. And I don't think it's entirely impossible that you could do a Confederacy of Dunces. I think it would be really hard to do in the present age. Uh, when Hollywood has been, to use the uh, the online phrase, institutionally captured, I really don't think it would be possible now. But I think it theoretically is possible for you to do. Certainly there's nothing in it that's not filmable. Lord knows I once upon a time said the same thing about a whole host of books. X, Y, and Z are unfilmable, and one by one they have fallen by the wayside. Uh, so I, of course, don't agree. If Greg is saying that these five novels can't be filmed, I think he's wrong. If, I, if he's saying, and he's not saying this, but if he's saying they shouldn't be filmed even if it could be done well, well, <laughs> I don't, of course, agree with that either. But, but when I was watching his video, I felt, I felt that a pennant had been stuck on a battlefield. <laughs> I, I thought I should make a response video of my own, and a natural response would, me, would be for me to say, either I could make a video saying, here are the ways that you could adapt the five books that he mentions to do them well. Here's one approach, one, one possibility for a director or a cast or an approach of some kind. I have a few ideas like that for Jerusalem. I'd love to see somebody try it, even if they fail. Uh, I mean, we all know the heartache, right, of somebody who takes a book that we love and adapts it poorly. <laughs> that, that's a heartache. I would argue that that doesn't happen nearly as often as Greg would say that it happens, but it does happen. I, I had my hopes up for a movie adaptation of Mark Halpern's novel, Winter's Tale. I didn't know at the time what kind of a cultural vandal Akiva Goldsman was. I thought, you know, just a director. And it had Russell Crowe, who does have someone who's usually absolute gold at picking projects. I thought, you know, Colin Farrell is a very talented actor. Russell Crowe is a movie star. Surely, and no, <laughs> no, no, not at all. But usually... I am at least intrigued by the result, and oftentimes I'm very gratified that somebody did this. Uh, whether, and whether you agree or not is something I would love to hear. Have you been disappointed by so many book-to-movie adaptations that you say a plague on, them all, on them both their houses? But one response video that I could make to Greg's would be to just do that, to just say, what kind of a project could you do for each, five, for each one of these five books that would have potential? And then I thought, no, no, what I want to do is make five books that I want to see adapted to the screen. But I've done all that. I've done a lot of those videos, too. And then I thought the best way to double down on my, on my, my spirited response to Greg's video would be to make a video in which I not only champion twice as many, so ten, book-to-movie adaptations, but champion them being remade. <laughs> so these are, I, I came up with ten books that have already been adapted into movies, and I want them to be done again. I want, you to, I want people to keep adapting them to the big screen. I thought we'd go through those in this, in this video just for the fun of it. This is such a fun subject. Um, the, one of the things that came to mind is not a novel. Uh, I really think it could do with a, re, with a, a new version. I really do, because the, the last version came out 60 years ago, 1963, and that's this. It's PT-109. The story of a young JFK uh, having his ship sunk from underneath him and saving his crew members in the, in the Pacific during World War II. I think this would be... There, there's a terrific story, a terrific movie to be made here. The, the Cliff Robertson movie from 1963 is not bad, but it's awful hammy and, and awful distracted. And obviously does not have the patina of age. It obviously does not have that, when now we do. Now JFK is a figure in the American pantheon, for good or ill. So I would, I would definitely want that. And there's another, but no, but it wouldn't be on this list because it's not a novel. And there's another exception that I'll finish up the list with. I'll, I'll start and finish with, with an exception. It's not a novel. But that I would still like to see done again. I think it could be done well. But the thing, the next thing that definitely is a novel uh, is this. <laughs> it's Dracula. <laughs> You, you think you've got the movie poster here with Bela Lugosi, and we also have uh, uh, Luke Evans 
did a 2014 Dracula movie that I don't even know what it was. It's it's largely not viewable, despite its huge uh, special effects budget, which might be playing into Greg's hands there. But I think the thing that we probably look at when we're thinking of who could adapt the actual book instead of just making something new out of it, I think we go to you know Coppola to Bram Stoker's Dracula with with Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves and Gary Oldman. And I, I don't think it's right that we should go to that. It's a, it's a, again, a hammy, very gimmicky, very weird movie that I think is very entertaining, but it's not Dracula. It, I mean, it, it, it ticks all the boxes and says all the things that Dracula says, but it's, it's not Dracula. Dracula is not a story about ordinary people encountering an extraordinary ancient evil. And it is always filmed that way. But that's not what Dracula is. Dracula is the story of ordinary people in an ordinary world, and into that ordinary world erupts this ancient, horrible evil. If you don't have that feeling of the real world being interrupted by an evil, then you have missed the essence of what makes Dracula an immortal work. And no one has ever done that for the screen, for the, for, for the big screen. Somebody should. <laughs> Somebody should. If, I mean, if you give me a Dracula in a, a cod Transylvanian accent wearing evening wear, Western evening wear, you have failed. If you give me a Dracula who's screaming at the top of his lungs and stabbing a crucifix, you have failed. <laughs> that is, that you have failed. You have given me a supernatural world in which a few ordinary people are going to stumble along and try to make do and that doesn't work that 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 is the typical the typical way that dracula is done i'd like to see dracula done right <laughs> would be nice uh well we'll move on <laughs> now a lot of the things that i'm going to talk about here including for all i know pt 109 uh certainly dracula a lot of things i'm going to talk about here probably have had adaptations more recently than the ones i'm thinking of they probably have many adaptations TV stuff, things like that, that I'm not aware of or am psychologically blocking out my mind. Uh, so I want to make sure that we know. I'm, I'm not saying these things haven't been filmed multiple times. I'm saying I'm calling for a new version in a Hollywood that doesn't exist anymore. So I'm, it, it's a fantasy exercise, but it's a fun thing to do. Like, for instance, this next one, a best-selling novel, Captains of the Kings by Taylor Caldwell. A vast, sprawling Irish immigration story that... If it's ever been done, it has never been done as a mainstream movie. It might have appeared on TV, and you wouldn't. I wouldn't want a miniseries because a miniseries would bring out would emphasize the negative aspects of this book. The book does go on, <laughs> and it's mawkish. It's it's very self consciously mawkish. And if you're going to do some sort of serialized miniseries, you're going to have to lean into the mawkishness, and mawkishness is bad. <laughs> so you want to get rid of that by doing what movie adaptations of books to the big screen usually do really well, which is to burn away the junk like that and just hone in on the actual story. There's a terrific story here. So that's another one that I would love to see. <laughs> I'm not making many fans here, I'm sure. But I think that Greg made his video to elicit responses. And who's going to respond to this other than me? Uh, I hope you all do. I want to hear all about this. What Make me a list of movies. Either make a response video in which you agree with Greg and give me five things that you don't ever want to see adapted. Or give me a video in which you give me things that you want to see adapted. Or in my case, readapted, like this next one. <laughs> This next one harkens all the way from 1949. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is Samson and Delilah. Starring Victor Mature, who is, at the time that this movie was made, was way too old to play Samson. Way too old. I mean, this is a Cecil B. DeMille mega, mega production, and they don't make him like that anymore. But uh, the thing I always want to point out to Cecil B. DeMille fans is that that's also 50% a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but Victor Mature is badly miscast. He's not a young man in this movie. Even his fans can't say so. There's only so much that Mascara can do. And Hedy Lamar? <laughs> not Hedy. Hedley. <laughs> How did he do such amazing feats with such tiny feet? <laughs> now go do that voodoo that you do so well. <laughs> when. We're not talking about Hedley Lamar here. We're talking about Hedy Lamar. 
they're all in here and they all do their bit and they're all cheesing things up but the movies aren't like this in 1947 movies were 1949 this was this story has been adapted many 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 times of course i am no one to slight the eye candy that was a young eric thal I really, really liked him as the utterly bewildered boyfriend in Six Degrees of Separation. And he's wonderful in, I think it was a TV version of uh, Samson and Delilah. But all I want is a big movie. This is actually a terrific story. Just the whole of it. If you, if you were to get a director to come at this and tell the whole of it as a story, it's a terrific story. It's bloody and bloodthirsty and weird and kinky and very passionate. No wonder it drew in crowds you know, in 1949, I'd love to see it done again, only in a different era. Our era has changed. I, I think this could be really, really fascinating. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a long shot, but we'll give it a try. And then this next one, some of you are just going to go, what? <laughs> you can't be asking for an adaptation. This thing has been adapted a million times. You might have already said that about Dracula. But I'm afraid the same thing is true here. This has been adapted a million times. For money, according to director visions, or God help us, anything, any the demographics, or whatever else, but never faithfully. And I would like to see a faithful movie adaptation of Tarzan of the Apes. <laughs> is that so much? Is that too much to ask? You, I always say, when it comes to Shakespeare adaptations, that you can uh, change the costumes, you can change the locations on the stage, you can change the bric-a-brac, but Shakespeare doesn't need your help. If you change the drama, you are making a mistake. Shakespeare doesn't need your help. And, you know, gotta love him, neither does Edgar Rice Burroughs. He doesn't need your help. He's telling a fantastic story in this novel. And it has never been told. <laughs> it has never been converted to the screen. Instead, every time it goes to the screen, it drastically changes. In ways that aren't warranted. <laughs> they aren't warranted. I, I, I don't want to think about I mean, I know that a lot of you movie dude bros are going to talk about Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan from the 1980s, with Christopher Lambert as Tarzan. For God's sake, I don't know what the dude bro fascination with that actor is. I, they, they, he cannot do any wrong. I understand with Rucker Howard because with Rucker Howard it's the exact same way. He can't do any wrong by dude bros. But he has always had a puckish sense of humor about what he does, and he's a genuinely commanding screen presence. Christopher Lambert, if you didn't know he was the star of the movie, you'd pass right over him in a crowd. And I, I, I realize that that movie, Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, or whatever, had Ian Holm in it, and he's really good because he's really good in everything. But what is Ralph Richardson doing in that movie? What is he doing in that movie? Tobogganing down the stairs on a dinner tray? <laughs> it's a ridiculous farce of a thing. And that's the closest that we get. I, I won't even talk about the Skarsgård thing that came out. I want Tarzan of the Apes. Not an adventure of Tarzan. Not the further adventures of Tarzan. I want Tarzan of the Apes, the, mo the, the book that Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote. I would say, is that too much to ask? But apparently it is. Uh, then, I'm going to do another war epic. And here I want to stress that I am not denigrating the original. Sometimes when I'm talking about these things, I will be. I am denigrating the Victor Mature Samson Delilah. I don't think any of you have ever seen it. I'm not denigrating, of course, Bela Lugosi as Dracula, but not an, as an adaptation of Bram Stoker's book. But, but in, this, in the case of this next book, I'm not denigrating the original. It would just be nice to have a really good, big, soaring, gripping new version. <sighs> We're going to go back to 1958. This is Run Silent, Run Deep. This is uh, Clark Gable and Burt Lancaster chewing the scenery, even though they're on the open ocean and underneath it. And this is an adaptation of, of Edward Beach's novel that... This is 1958, and there's a lot of evidence to that effect in the course of this movie. These actors... Okay, I was, I was going to say they can't turn in a bad performance, but Clark Gable very much can turn in a bad performance. He almost does in this movie. In my opinion, Burt Lancaster can't turn in a bad performance, but even so, <laughs> it's, been, it's been 60 years. Surely it's time. This is, a tr in its bones, this is a terrific, terrific story. The book sold like hotcakes. Why not do it again? Now, why not, why not give us another big screen, run silent, run deep? I don't know who would go to see it, but <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, 
Uh, this next one, boo. <laughs> this next one is from 1935. So almost a century old. It's made from a great novel by a great Irish writer. But a century, almost a century, a decade shy of a century, is way too long to go without another version of The Informer, starring Victor McLaughlin in a dramatic role. It's the story of a man who informs on his friends and is hunted by his former revolutionary colleagues for grassing, for, you know, snitches die in ditches, that sort of thing. And I know it's sacrilege for, for, for me to call that for any John Ford production to have a new movie, but... Again, a century of history has passed since this thing came out. I think it would be possible to do, and I would like to see it. I would like to see it. I would like to see someone do an intelligent, thoughtful, very powerful, maybe slightly more violent, because it's the 21st century, so that, that's unavoidable. I'd like to see somebody do a new version of this. Uh, <laughs> just, just, just give it a try and see. And uh, the, the John Ford version of The Informer is not well-known, even among George Ford fans. So it's not such sacrilege for me to uh, suggest that it be redone. This next one, though, oh boy. <laughs> I don't want to infuriate the dude bros. But they, if they know about this movie, most of them don't know about this movie, especially the movie bros on YouTube who don't know anything about movies at all before Star Wars. Or before the Michael Keaton Batman. <laughs> Literally don't know anything about it at all and will sneer at the idea of sitting down and watching anything from the first 150 years of theater. <laughs> they don't, don't know anything about it at all. Before the Michael Keaton Batman. Before that, or maybe before George Lucas Star Wars. Other than that, nothing. But if they did find this movie, if they did discover it somehow and find it, they would definitely champion it for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and I, So if there were some out there who would do that, or foreign film, super pretentious foreign film aficionados, I want this to be remade. From the ground up. The, the movie version was terrible. I'm referring to this. I'm referring to 1967. That is uh, Marcello Mastroianni. He is, he is as an unbelievable adult cinematic presence. I'm, I'm not denying that at all. He has an unbelievably adult cinematic presence, like Gable, like Burt Lancaster, even like poor Victor Mature, uh, or, or, you know, Victor McLaughlin. But this takes lots of liberties with the book. And the book has an elemental kind of almost fable-like power. It's been a long, long time. This thing came out in 1960s, 1967 or 68. That's a long time. That's, that's 60 years. Time for a remake of a book that is taught in every school. It's assigned to thousands of students every year. Surely there's an audience for a remake of The Stranger. <laughs> it would be nice. Uh, now, I'm making, <laughs> making a list here of movies that I want to see readapted for the screen. And there are a whole bunch of reasons why you could do that. Like I mentioned, there's nothing wrong with the Burt Lancaster Run Silent, Run Deep. I would just like to see someone else try it with the, the, the greater cinematic visual energy that, that 21st century movies tend to have, uh, the broader scope that 21st century movies tend to have. You, you tend to sink in, you know, what at the time would have been, you know, for Run Silent, Run Deep, that came out in 1958. The national budget for the whole of the United States in 1958 was a little less than what Hollywood tends to spend on one blockbuster now. The whole budget of the United States, everything. That can buy you some dividends. So, you know, it. I am saying partially that a lot of these things are fairly good, have fairly, uh, you know, accessible moments. I wouldn't change a bit of the Lon Chaney Dracula for, or the Bela Lugosi Dracula. But in some cases, the major movie adaptation is an abomination. <laughs> and, the, and the reason that I'm calling for it to be redone is because it, the abomination could then be buried. We could collect all the original reels of it and bury it deep in some nuclear waste disposal site or something like that. And uh, when it comes to cinematic abominations of books adapted to movies, we can certainly go to the 1990s. We can go to this, <laughs> this thing, the Demi Moore Scarlet Letter, uh, which is an abomination in every way. It is horrible, of course. Demi Moore ha may have some uh, acting ability, but she is not attractive 
And Gary Oldman has never been attractive at any age in any way for either gender, for either sex, for in prick up your ears or anything else. He's never been attractive in any way. It's not it's not his strong suit. There was an attempt made in the 1980s, the early 1990s, to sort of think, well, maybe, maybe sort of sex single, single Gary Oldman. But no, no, that was a bad idea. If he ever bought onto it, it was a bad advice on the part of his managers. But on top of that, this does not this does not well adapt Nathaniel Hawthorne's book. Obviously, if you've seen this thing, then you know what I mean. There's an abomination at the heart of this thing that has to go. And there's no way to fix this movie. There's no magical director's cut. So I would like a new version of, of The Scarlet Letter. Thank you very much. Uh, then this, this next one, we're going to go all the way back to Sean D. Stanfast territory. We're going to go back to the silence. We're going to go back to 1913. So that's over a century ago. Uh, for the adaptation of a great novel, a novel that was an unbelievable bestseller in its day. The novel was The Cloister and the Hearth by Charles Reed, and it told the story of an artistic, sensitive young boy whose parents seem determined to send him into the priesthood, where he does not want to go. He wants to live by his pen. Look at this. <laughs> That's Look at that. I don't even know what her name is. Probably Sean knows everything about her, but I, I don't even know what her name is. I don't know anybody who was in this thing from 1913. That's the last time anyone tried to adapt The Cloister and the Hearth. That's ridiculous. Granted, the book is gone now. I don't think there's a paperback of it. I don't think there's a hardcover of it. I don't think it exists anymore in print. But once upon a time, it was everything. And that's because, as I often say, it had good bones. It would make for a great, for a great movie that you could do today, a <laughs> hundred years after the original version came out. Let's let's move a little bit further in time for this next one with, to 1958. We'll go back to 1958. And this is something you already know. You all already know that I love this book. And I also love this movie. But it could definitely be redone. It could, if you had, if you had permission, Hollywood no longer has permission. Hollywood, Hollywood studios have adapted in legal language, as legal as legally binding contracts with their staff, uh, diversity check marks and and uh, kneeling obeisance to the uh, progressive stack. So you can't do movies like you literally can't make them anymore. But if you could, if you could, maybe Hollywood is tired of all of the movies that uh, that kneel to the progressive stack catastrophically failing at the box office. Maybe they're tired of that. They're not legally obligated to appease 12 psychos on Twitter. They could, they're not legally obligated to do that. They could start making movies for the masses again. If they did, they couldn't make this, this movie now. But if they were to do that in some hypothetical, you could remake The Last Hurrah. <laughs> this starred Spencer Tracy, and the, uh, the movie poster made a very wise choice to show us all of the great character actors who were in here. Just uh, This is the adaptation of Edwin O'Connor's great novel, The Last Hurrah, about a wily old politician running for office one last time. Now, in this movie from 1958, Spencer Tracy is not old enough. Uh, but there's a lot of great casting in here, and you could make a terrific political movie out of this and make it funny, but also uh, more touching. There are, there's only one touching scene in this movie. And I, there, you could argue that there's only one or two touching scenes in the novel, but I get, in other words, what I'm saying is, although this is really good, I would love to see a new adaptation of this. I'd love to see it tried again. Uh, and we'll, we'll finish up with, uh, with another adaptation. This is from 1947, so this is a long, long time ago. It's not a novel, uh, but I'd love to see it adapted again. I'd love to see what someone could do with it. I, I don't know that, that contemporary Hollywood is very good at making comedy. Uh, dystopic comedy. Horrible, biting, cynical comedy, sure. Where, but actual comedy where you're just supposed to have fun laughing. I don't often see that much in Hollywood anymore, so this might be too much to ask. But this is the uh, the 1947 adaptation uh, of Betty McDonald's best-selling book, The Egg and I. This had Claudette Colbert and Fred, Mc, Fred McMurray, and they, they're doing their best. <laughs> they're doing their best in this movie. They're routinely upstaged by the great, experienced character actors doing the bit parts. Uh, and... There's there's some physical comedy in here that just doesn't work. It's it's a charming movie, but I would love to see someone else try it. I would love to see someone try to be maybe better, maybe more evenly balanced, maybe more charming. 
I think it could be done. I honestly do. Uh, so there you go. That is my spirited response <laughs> to, to Greg's video where he says not only that his five novels should never be adapted to any screen, big or small, but that he's not a fan of adaptations at all. I am a fan of adaptations. I often think that they improve the original book. And these have already had their shot. They've already been adapted. I just want them to be adapted again. And on and on until somebody does a fantastic job, until somebody gives us a gem. There have been plenty of gems. Big screen and small screen gems made out of books. But that, that brings me back to my, to my beginning question here. Because the whole fun, I mean, Greg and I could joust all day long. But the whole fun here is to involve the rest of you. And I want to know, first of all, do you agree with crusty old curmudgeon version of Greg that says that no book should ever be adapted to a movie? You cannot hold that opinion. I don't think he holds that opinion. I don't think anyone can. It's not a tenable position. But do you agree with his underlying contention that most movie adaptations worsen the book, that they don't do justice to the text? Do you agree with his side contention that CGI is usually a direct indicator of how bad a movie is? The more of it, the worse the movie. Love to hear that. I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. And also on the subject, maybe some of you old cinemaphiles might tell me what, what book-to-movie adaptations have already been made that you would like to see tried again. <laughs> I would love to hear. I would love to hear all of that. This subject is just endless fun. So I'm going to wrap this up. That's all I have to say for this one. I'll leave a link to Greg's video. You should definitely watch it. And I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.